Good morning and welcome. My name is Rich Voles. I'm the Assistant Professor of Preaching and Worship at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, apparently very snowy Richmond, Virginia. Um, so welcome. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a minute, but I was wondering if we could just start, especially since we have a smaller group, to sort of begin with introductions. If you could tell me your name, uh, where you're from, and maybe if this is your first time at the Academy of Preachers, and I'll say more about uh, my experience with the Academy of Preachers in a minute as well. So who'd like to start? Anybody? Please. Uh, I'm Sarah. Right now I live in Waco, Texas. Uh, this is my first national festival, but I've been to several regional ones. Okay, great. Keep it going. Start with the name, <laughs> and then where you're from, and perhaps a little bit about your AOP experience, uh, you know, a number of times here. Uh, my name is Evan Shearer, I'm living now in Illinois, uh, and it's, I first got involved with the Academy probably, well, it was 2012, so. Okay. Fantastic. All right, great. This side of the room? Hey, I'm Evan. I'm from Mechanical, Virginia. Okay. This is my first time here. Okay, great. Welcome. I'm Melissa Ballin. I'm the director of admissions at Baptist Theological Seminary in Richmond. And this is my first interview. Okay, great. I'm Michael and Veal. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I'm a retired pastor there. Hey, we've got a the Richmond contingent right here. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every time I leave town, it snows, my wife tells me. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about myself. This is um, sort of my first visit back with the Academy of Preachers in a long time. I was there in the beginning um, when Dwight was going around to visit uh, seminaries. I was a PhD student at Vanderbilt, um, and uh, I was actually beginning to write my dissertation on young people in preaching, uh, which ended up in this book, uh, which is available in the bookstore. Um, just have to get that plug in there. Um, and so uh, this is the first time I've been back in probably four or five years or so. So I'm glad to see where the Academy has come and glad to see that um, you all are from so many different places. Well, at least that side of the room is from so many different places. Um, and so today I, I want to talk about um, and think through with you preaching as pastoral care. Um, I wrote this other book um, called Tending the Tree of Life, and you can't see the subtitle there, but the sub subtitle is Preaching and Worship Through Reproductive Loss and Adoption. So um, let me tell you a little bit about my story. So um, my wife and I both went to graduate school. I went to seminary, uh, and then uh, she was a graduate student in uh, education. And then we moved to, to Nashville, Tennessee, where I um, went on to do uh, to my, my doctoral work. And um, as we were beginning that process, we also felt like na then was the appropriate time for us uh, to begin uh, starting a family. And we had been married for four years at that time. And as young, healthy adults, we figured, well, uh, just as it was happening for our friends, it would happen quickly and easily for us as well. Uh, it came to turn out that that was not the case, um, that uh, our bodies did not cooperate with our, our minds and our wills. Uh, in our spirits to begin a family. And, and at this time, I had transitioned out of pastoral ministry, and I was now a pew sitter. And I was beginning to think through uh, this experience that I was having of trying to have children and uh, not being able to have children. And lo and behold, what were some of the stories from the scriptures that were being preached? Abram and Sarai, right? Uh, who are very old and have a miracle baby, right? Uh, Hannah and Elkanah, right? Hannah goes and prays in the temple and she's praying and the, the priest thinks that she's drunk. She's praying so hard, right? And uh, nothing has happened for her for years and years and, uh, and Elkanah's other wife is making, making fun of her and eventually miracle baby. Well, the preachers that I heard preach these stories Preach them all, of course, as if they were stories of faith. These are about stories of faith. And never was the reality of my experience addressed. 
of reproductive loss, right? And I began, for the very first time in my life, as somebody who grew up in the church, not somebody who was just a church mouse, but a church rat, somebody who was there whenever the doors were open, and I had my own key as a young person growing up, so I let myself in and out of the church, um, I began to feel myself very much as an outsider to the faith experience. This was very disconcerting for me, to feel myself on the outside of preaching, on the outside of, uh, of the faith experience, on the outside of preaching, on the outside of the scriptures themselves, to have no point of contact with my life. This was very problematic for me, as you might imagine. Uh, and so we, we negotiated this process. I'll spare you all of those details. Um, and uh, ultimately uh, ended up, uh, after going through several um, treatment procedures, uh, we decided we've, we've gone as far as we can go in terms of, of, of uh, reproductive technologies. And very prayerfully, uh, we let go of that aspiration and that dream and that hope, and we entered into the uh, adoption process, which was a completely different uh, language field, uh, learned a brand new grammar, uh, a brand new way of, of thinking and being in the world. Uh, and two and a half, three years later, uh, we end up with this now almost seven-year-old. Um, she was born on a Monday, uh, and we picked her up from the hospital on Wednesday, uh, on a Wednesday. Um, so Ellie has been in our, in our family since she was three days old, and this is my daughter. Um, but I, I, I also approached the scriptures and never heard adoption lifted up as an important metaphor, as an important experience, as an important way of being family in the world. And do you know, do you know the way that Paul describes salvation? Oh, yeah. When was the last time you heard a sermon about that? Yeah, crickets. And here was this beautiful metaphor at the heart of the way that Paul describes the gospel. And it had never been lifted up to me and presented as such. This was a problem. And this is why I decided to write the book, uh, Tending the Tree of Life. And so what I'd like to do is kind of trace through some things this morning um, that I think are helpful approaches uh, to, to think through and to preach in a way that provides pastoral care so that people don't have the same kinds of experiences that I had when I was sitting in the pew for a variety of different experiences. So since we, we are a small group, what I'd like for you to do is perhaps sort of turn to the sides of the room that you're on, sort of make your own little collective. The Richmond Collective will, will be over here, and then you all from the scattered parts of the country can gather over here. And I'd just like to, for you all to think through a bit. Um, keep a list. You've got paper in front of you. If you need pens, I can give you pens. But what are the kinds? You've heard mine, uh, the sort of big presenting issue, the, the, the issue which uh, I see pastoral care through at predominantly. But what are the kinds of pastoral, pastoral care issues um, that might be present in a congregation or community of faith when it gathers for worship? week to week basis. So I'll give you three, four, five minutes. Uh, I'll just kind of listen for when you run out of ideas. Go.
Take about two more minutes. All right, take another 30 seconds. Let's regather. So what you got? What, what's on your list? Chime in. Yeah, suicide, mm -hmm. um, and along with family issues, divorce, uh, relationship with caring for older adults, yeah, yeah, uh, sure. dementia, other mm -hmm. things, incarceration, mm -hmm. uh, loss of faith, yeah. sexual identity, mm -hmm. uh, and a variety of transitions in mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Anybody else want to add? Something you didn't hear that you were thinking about? Uh, I skipped uh, trouble with kids, trouble with teens. Yeah. Uh, I had a family in my previous church that had a large span of kids, but they were all going through some sort of self destructive behavior, even down to the 10 year old. Mm. Mm. Others? Things we missed? So check my list. Um, aging, you mentioned relocation. Um, perhaps in some uh, context, spiritual abuse uh, or trauma from violence, from abuse of, of different kinds or discrimination. Um, I heard divorce and family tensions and troubled relationships. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good list. So uh, we want to think our people are coming to us as preachers with all of this stuff, right? Uh, and how is it that we engage it uh, responsibly, effectively, lovingly, uh, and how is it that we uh, put it through a lens as such that we can be people who deal with it faithfully, right? And so one of the things when we talk about pastoral care issues in the pulpit, I want to be very clear about uh, our power and our authority, and I want to be clear as well about our limits, and I think this is an important note. Uh, Kathy Black has written this wonderful book, which I commend to you, called A Healing Homiletic, Preaching and Disability, I think disability is one of those issues we could add to the list, um, and it's a, a way we can sort of focus our thinking about pastoral care issues. And she brings to us, through the lens of disability, thinking about the difference between healing and cure. The difference between healing and cure. And so Kathy says, disability is a part of everyday existence, and you can fill in, you know, take out disability and put in whatever it is that, that the, we've added to our list this morning. It's a part of everyday existence for millions of people and their loved ones in this world. When cure is not currently possible, meaning the removal for her talking about disability, right? When cure is not possible, healing can happen through supportive accepting community through our own ability under, undergirded by God's strength and the support of others to make it through the hard times and through the different new possibilities that are open for us. So it, you, you grasp the, 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 the difference between healing and cure, that 
cure would be the removal of whatever, perhaps it's the family, the, the tension, uh, the sickness, uh, whatever the case might be, whereas healing is a different uh, a layering of circumstances so that people can imagine themselves as moving through whatever the issue is and, and dealing with whatever the issue is and envisioning new possibilities on the other side. There's a real difference there. And there's a real difference in the way that we preach when we preach toward cure, right? Uh, we are naming things perhaps that we cannot do or forcing God uh, or putting God on the hook to do. God is going to cure you of your fill in the blank, right? Uh, I don't think it's appropriate for us to, to put God in that corner, right? Whereas I think we can, as the community of faith, work toward healing. And I think that's an important difference. That's a more responsible use of our pastoral authority. And it also touches on a different word that uh, comes to us from the Hebrew tradition of shalom, right? This sense of wholeness and peace, right? Uh, salvation in a sort of larger scope and sense, where healing is, is, being, uh, is finding fulfillment and finding wholeness through whatever situation we might be enduring. Right? And that's what we're preaching toward. That's what we're bringing people into worship for. Are there questions at this point along the way? I want to say that I don't want to do the bulk of the talking. I, I wanted us to be back and forth. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to kind of raise your hand and I'll call on you. And we, we can continue to talk. Is that clear? Did you have something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so say, say a little bit more about your question in terms of, quote, unquote, other cultures. What, what, t fill that out a little bit for us. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. <laughs> no, you're fine. I, those kinds of questions are good questions, but I think it's a very important in a kind of religiously pluralistic world for us to, 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 to think about how is it that we approach, uh, whether that's uh, in the counseling room, right, or whether that's in our preaching and worship, how people are understanding uh, Christianity's relationship to other religions and how, you know, what we mean when we talk about healing versus cure. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Pursue it. Write a good paper about it. <laughs> so I, um, I want to move and talk about something that I heard from them, and I won't reveal this person's identity because they're very guilty. Um, th this, I, I read this quote uh, from a very important person in theological education. It said uh, They were giving a lecture, and they said, Real ministry happens not in the pulpit, but where the people are and where they are hurting. What? <laughs> Uh, this was very problematic to me because where is the place uh, to address the hurts of the world in our ministries? Well, the, the, for this person, they were naming um, the pastor's office or community ministries as the appropriate place to deal with the places where people are hurting. I think that's really limiting to the scope of the pulpit. Um, I think we need to daringly respectfully and lovingly address people's most pressing concerns in the pulpit, acknowledging that not everything in this world is easily solved. So let me provide a, a theological rationale for this preaching as pastoral care business. Christine Smith, uh, in her really fantastic book, Preaching as Weeping, Confession and Resistance, says this, preaching is an act of public theological naming. It's an act of disclosing and articulating new truths about our present human existence. It's an act of bringing new reality into being, an act of creation. It's an act of redeeming and transforming reality, an act of shattering illusions and cracking open limited perspectives. It is nothing less than the interpretation of our present world and an invitation to build a profoundly different new world. What do you hear in that that resonates with you in terms of preaching as pastoral care? Um, I got a 
his sister, who is um, very dear to me, and we're living together right now, uh, have been for several years. Um, and Catherine is very good at reading cultural narratives mm -hmm. and um, discerning where that is. And she's been very good to me, uh, saying, this is the cultural narrative that you're believing, and it's wrong. And I want you to, to live in, in live in truth and live in joy, so stop believing this mm -hmm. and believe the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what came up when you read that quote, is that that's supposed to be our role in the pulpit, is mm -hmm. to say, this is, this is wrong, we're going to stop living it, okay. and to, to name it. Okay. Okay. What else? Anything else? I want to suggest that when we approach pastoral care issues in the pulpit, that there are a lot of different kinds of narratives that shape the way we interpret the world and interpret our own human experiences. And as preachers, we are responsible for placing a theological framework, an interpretive framework on top of people's life experiences so that they can interpret their own uh, human condition and, the own, and their own human experience of which all these different kinds of pastoral care issues are a part. So the preacher's job is to theologically name the world, to theologically describe the world, to theologically interpret the world, and human experience is an integral component of that. There's another question that goes along with this for me so when I hear th this quote, that real ministry doesn't happen in the pulpit, but where people, you know, out there, or in the counseling office, I want to say to myself, what is the extent of the reign and rule and realm and, and, and kingdom and kingdom of God? Is there a place where uh, boundaries rise up and we are no longer to name the world through the lens of the realm, the reign, the rule of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God? And there are powerful cultural barriers for us of things that we are supposed to talk about and not supposed to talk about in the pulpit. And I want to press those. Because the kingdom of God is very far-reaching and wide-reaching. Did you have something you want to press back? Go ahead. It's all right. Okay. That's all right. Um, and in this act of theological naming, what we want to do is we want to move people from what's called embedded theologies to deliberative theologies. Yes. All right. I'm getting a head shake back there. All right. Yeah. We want to move people from their embedded theologies to deliberative theologies. So let me say uh, uh, something about uh, what an embedded theology. So uh, all of us are walking around in the world, preachers and lay people uh, and people of faith and people of no faith are walking around in the world with the theologies that are just sort of rumbling around in them. They're just at work. You know, maybe they, they learned it from TV. Maybe they learned it from the Bible. Maybe they learned it from their church. Maybe they learned it, learned it from grandma. Um, but we all have these embedded theologies within us uh, about the way we see the world working, about how we see God interacting with the world. Uh, and not always are all those embedded theologies really helpful or healthy. Right? Oftentimes they are, but sometimes they're not. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those might be in a little bit. But what we want to do is to name the world and help people interpret the world in such a way and their, uh, their experiences in such a way that they're able to make sense of them and move through the world with a more uh, considered, uh, more measured, more deliberative theology that they're able to weigh um, the ways that they've experienced the world in the past, the ways that they're experiencing God in the present, and the way that they're able to interpret their experience. Go ahead. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we, we, we walk around with these embedded theologies and then we have a different kind of experience in the world, right? And it begins to sort of poke at our embedded theologies and to say, well, wait a minute, do these, do these ideas I have about God and how God is present and how God is active and the way that God is working in the world, does it actually fit? Does it match this experience that I'm having? This was the problem that I was having, right? Uh, when I was talking about my issues, this is the problem that a lot of people have when somebody dies unexpectedly or when they lose their job, right? Uh, I, I, you know, I always thought that God would take care of me, right? That God would always be with me, that God would provide, God is the great provider, right? That God will always provide what I need. And now that that's being tested, right? If I lose my job or I'm, uh, you know, underemployed, Right? And so people begin to feel the seams and the cracks in their own theology. And our job is to help name and shape that in significant ways. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge important reality. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because this happens a lot in family systems, particularly where young people go off, they go off to college or seminary and they have these fancy new seminary ideas about you know the God and the world and it just doesn't match. Yeah, did you have something to add? Well, I was gonna ask, because I'm still, still trying to figure out my home. Mm -hmm. Because I used to be so close with my family, but ever since I was a teenager, I was like, I don't know Yeah, negotiating that in family systems is a fun adventure. Luckily, this workshop is not on that. <laughs> right? Um, I, I, and I'm not, not um, belittling your question there, but I, I do want to just keep us close to the pulpit, if you will, um, because that's, that's, that's different. Um, and, and you're naming distance, right? Uh, that distance is not necessarily there when you're responsible for people uh, in the pulpit, right? And when you're their pastor and you're walking with them every day, then those changes and those shifts happen in little ways along the ways, right? Can I, can I, can I kind of restate and make sure I got some understanding? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, basically, you want people to move from going from basically what we call default mode to a, something that is more intentional. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, and I want to I wanna reiterate that the, the default mode may not always be bad. Right. I, I want to make sure and, and make that statement that, you know, some of the, the default mode theologies that I've heard as a as a pastor are better than my supposed wonderfully deliberative theologies that I took a lot of time reading big books about. You know, uh, I learned a lot of theology sipping lemonade in a rocking chair on somebody's front porch, you know. Um, but, yeah, you're right uh, to, to be more intentional. Uh, about the way it is that we consider the world, especially when we encounter these cracks and seams and these experiences that 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 cause us to go, wait a minute, right? Um, whatever issue it is that presents itself that it has come into my life has sort of messed with the way that I understand God's action in the world and God's presence with me or the community. So, in, in terms of communities, let's let's press on. Um, I think there are two goals of preaching as pastoral care. And the first is, is one to simply form communities of care. Individualism and personal piety is, uh, is so, uh, looms so large in our Christian culture in America 
that um, we often think that pastoral care issues are simply personal work, right? Something that you take care of in, in the, the therapist's office or uh, the pastor's office, or you just kind of wrestle with it on your own in church. But I want to submit to you, to you all this morning that this is not just personal work, that this is the work of the church. And so we have to develop a robust, the fancy word for this is ecclesiology, right? A theology of being church with one another that accounts for the ways that we uh, are vulnerable, that our lives are vulnerable, and the, how we relate to one another. If we make the choice to be silent about the important pastoral care issues that are going on in people's lives, then I think silence leads to isolation, the kind of isolation that I described. I felt like I was alone, that my experience was not in the room. It leads to distance, distance from the people who are beside me in the pew or the row, right? Uh, without a safe space to reach toward healing and wholeness. And we simply, by not addressing, by staying silent, um, by not forming a, a community of, co uh, of care, we consign people's greatest issues, the weight that people are bringing with them into worship, uh, to the private realm. The church is not the place for this, is what we say to them, essentially. Uh, Don Salyers, who used to teach worship at Candler School of Theology, has this wonderful line in his book, um, Worship as Theology. Uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Um, he says, worship is the place where um, the divine ethos meets human pathos. Worship is the place and the event where divine ethos meets human pathos. Now, when I talk to lay people about uh, worship and I tell them, you know, I, get, I give them that fancy definition and I say, what Salyers means by this is that worship is where all of who we are meets all of who God is. And I want us to bring the all of who we are and not have to partition parts of our lives off from the worship experience. So when we think about forming communities of care, we want to think about three dimensions of the ways that our pulpit ministries work. When we think about mutuality in ministry, what do you mean by that? Uh, what we mean by that is connecting people in relationships where they're responsible for the care of one another. We're connecting people in relationships where they're responsible for the care of one another. Again, this is identifying a robust theology of what it means to be church. It's not just the pastor's job. It's not just my job as pastor to care for you. But it's naming in intentional ways throughout the preaching life that it's your job to care for the person who's in the seat next to you or in the pew behind you, right? Or the people who are sitting up in the balcony or however it is that your church is configured, right? We are responsible for taking care of one another. We're responsible for one another's care, right? Um, in the churches that I grew up, the old women had it right, right? Um, the, the sign and signal of this was the casserole. Right? This is the, one of the ways that, that, that we showed that we cared for one another when somebody died or when somebody was going through a hard time or when they had a surgery. Right? This is just a small slice of what that meant. Right? The casserole meant, I'm responsible for you. Not just, I know you're hungry right? and it's hard for you to fix dinner in this time, but I'm responsible for caring for you. So mutuality in ministry. The second is Hospitality. And again, drawing on that quote from Salyers, it, when we think about hospitality, we recognize that we bring all of ourselves to worship, that we don't just chop off parts of who we are and leave it outside the door, but rather we bring all of who we are into worship. And this is a gift worth caring about. When you bring your deepest self and your fullest self into worship, that's a gift for me to receive. Uh, it's not just a, a responsibility right, or a burden for me to have to carry you. It's a gift for you to bring all of yourself. And there are ways that we can signal this in our preaching. Right? It, it, how often do you signal this in your sermons? That it's okay to not be okay. And that it's okay in this space, whatever your space is, to not be okay. The point is to welcome all of who we are, all of one another's lives, and not just the parts of them that we want to show right, to others that we're proud of or that we hope 
everybody can see. And the final one is uh, care, care and compassion for the world. So we recognize that our individual problems are tied up with other societal systems. Right? When we think about uh, forming a community of care, we recognize that people's hurts are part of larger systems. I didn't um, click on the link to find the data, but I saw the other day that infant mortality rates are up in Flint, Michigan. So you've got grieving mothers and fathers and wider family systems. And the, co the correlation, ostensibly, is that the water that's being consumed in Flint right, is leading to higher infant mortality rates. So there's the issue of grief Yes, very real and very present, but it is in no way divorced from this real uh, societal, political, economic, racial issues. This is important for us to know that when people grieve, it's not just, just a tiny little family system, right? But it may very well be bound up in larger issues. And so our work uh, for pastoral care in the pulpit is never divorced from prophetic care for others and the work that we do in our communities and indeed in the world. So when we think about forming communities of care, when we think about being church with and for one another, we've got to think larger than the systems that are just present to us, right? We need to think larger about the ways that, that pastoral care issues are affected by societal uh, problems and indeed by that S word, sin, right? The sin of race and economy and politics, right? Any questions about this goal number one, forming communities of care? And book, I do, yeah. Lee Ramsey's book, Careful Preaching, From Sermon to Caring Community. It's a recognition, a basic theological anthropology, right? What it means to be human. We're connected, that our lives are connected. And in our preaching, we need to signal and develop ways to, to let people know and recognize that we are indeed connected. Right. Everybody good? Questions? All right. Second goal would be this. Um, to create effective pastoral communication. That sounds like a mouthful and it sounds rather dry. What do we mean by this? Well, preaching is not just a theological act. It's a rhetorical act as well, right? And I want to skip to the second point first and then come back to restoration. When we, uh, when we preach, we create communities or publics, right? Um, we're going to create one kind of version of a public or another. Our sermons will either include people or they will exclude people. So think about um, your preaching and your sermons. Who are the heroes in your sermons? When you think about when you tell stories, uh, when um, you use illustrations, who becomes the theological heroes in your preaching? Are they always white men? Right? Are they you? Right? Are they people who have it all figured out? Um, who's in and who's out by virtue of the ways in which you preach? We create publics. We create uh, a recognition of the kind of communities that we envision when we preach. And so one of the important questions to ask when you think about your sermons, not just the, the one sermon that you're working on for this week or next week, um, but over the long haul, is what kind of community am I creating through this sermon and through my preaching? Is it a restored and restoring public? Knowing uh, that you're part of a restoring community can be a powerful affirmation, even when my particular issue is not being talked about. I know that there's room for me, right? So that when we think about developing a public uh, in, our, in our preaching, when we think about who's in and who's out, when we are intentional over the long haul of our preaching, people can find their way in even if you're not talking about their specific issue. Right. 
What do I mean by restoration? This is deeply connected to that sense of healing rather than cure, right? And it's also connected to that sense of shalom. So for Randy Nichols, he says that restoration carries a dual commitment to past and to future, to old and to new, to here and elsewhere. He says the work of restoration is neither losing the past nor living in it, but rather creating a present that reaches realistically out to both past and future. Restoration is neither harsh confrontation of the inadequacies of what and whom we deal with, nor passive acceptance of them. It involves the creation of something new that both acknowledges its ancestry and embraces the growing yet to come. I'll give you a second to kind of process that. But what resonates for you in this quote when you think about shalom, when you think about healing, when you think about um, creating a, a, a kind of preaching that enables people to see and find restoration. I think part of what it hits for me, um, and as you've been talking, it's kind of figuring out where the line is of challenge, mm -hmm. um, that challenging people's theology to create a more broader, inclusive community. Um, you know, how's the pastoral care in that? You know, for, for somebody who's sitting in a pew who believes that pray hard enough, God will give it to you. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't need to hear that, because that wasn't helpful for you. Mm -hmm. For a pastor to just blow that up, that notion of, that creates a lot of dissonance with them, and then how you pastorally care for them mm -hmm. in the midst of <laughs> their theology and unraveling. So I do appreciate the, the restoration is new, the harsh confrontation of the inadequacy. So you don't just blow people out of the water. You're wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, thank you. Others? Well, this doesn't back away from the fact that we need to confront what is wrong. Yeah. I mean, we need to confront that. But we also come back to what Paul says, is that we bear one of his burdens, mm -hmm. and realizing that we are not perfect either. Yeah. That we come by as a, as a what I like to call under the shoulder. You've seen athletes that pull people off and put them under their shoulder. That's how we're supposed to be as Christians. Mm -hmm. So many times as Christians, we put a, put a gun in their head and say, I do that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you off. Mm -hmm. I think also what, what Nichols means by this is that we don't have to leave off the painful past. We don't just drop it off. Right? We, uh, uh, we, we, and we carry it into the future in a new way with us. Right? Uh, and we acknowledge the yet to come. There seems something very distinctly Christian about that that we embrace the yet to come. Um, you know, new things, a better, right? Even if we can't name it at this point. Did you have a question or thought? Okay, thought I saw your hand. Um, so I think what, what Nichols wants us to do, and I think his impulse is right, is to help people find a way to make a new path with their lives out of whatever it is that they're dealing with. Got it yet? Keep leaning forward like you're, you're ready. I guess my head keeps taking me in a different direction with this. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Okay. Again, <laughs> great question. Yeah, um, well, I, th I think that's also to sort of skip back, right, is to recognize wh what is it that our, how far does our community of care go? Is it just the people inside the room who gather for worship on Sundays? Or does our recognition that our lives are intertwined extend further, even if, uh, and here we might sort of press on people's notions of who the church is or what the church is, but how is it that our lives as people of faith are connected to those who may not share the same faith commitments that we do, right? Uh, and how is it that we recognize that our lives are deeply intertwined with them? 
no matter what faith commitments they bring to the table or not to the table, right? Does that, does that help? Yeah. Okay. No, you're fine. As I said, I, I hope that we're kind of engaging in conversation rather than me just downloading information. That's, that's boring. I have a question about the creating of communities in public. So mm -hmm. Isn't it possible that the pastor in his or her preaching ministry uh, can, uh, in the process of creating heroes or heroines, uh, open wide the community uh, to, to a, a, a variety of Yes. And in the process, uh, eventually create a community that in, its, in itself unhealthy to the detriment of the community of the church. All right, say the last part again for me. I was with you. Uh, let me give you an illustration. Go for it. What you're touching on is an important um, distinction that, in fact, Nichols makes uh, in his work. There's a, dis there's a complete dis uh, distinction between, uh, and we're talking about how the preacher uses the preacher's own life in preaching. There's a distinction between self-disclosure and self-display. And that's one. Yeah. That was my concern. Yeah, yeah. The second part that you've named for us, what I hear, is self-display. Where the pastor is using her or his own life uh, to win friends, to gain a public that is faithful to her or himself, uh, to use the pulpit for his or her own healing and his or her own needs. That's what I hear, right? There was some psychological need, and so they talked about themselves to make themselves feel better or to build themselves up or to, uh, to uh, do away with whatever inadequacy they might have felt, right? Um, Versus self-disclosure, which is a very healthy way of talking about one's life, right? Um, not using, and that's, I think that's the, um, the defining line that brings us from self-disclosure to self-display is the use for power, right? Uh, in unhealthy ways. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So when I when we talk about, um, uh, you know, I never want to say that that uh, pastoral care uh, that happens in the pastor's office or with a therapist is an unhealthy thing. I, I, what I want, I'm coming at it from the opposite direction to say uh, I have heard and people have have made uh, made clear in some ways through their preaching that some pastoral care issues are only for right. Uh, the office, but I think you're absolutely right that we need to to validate, to lift up, um, particularly around areas of mental health and mental illness, that people need to find and seek the help that they can get to to work on their stuff. Right? Absolutely, we need to validate that. Thank you. Other questions around these two major goals. So let's move into some practical strategies then. Some general strategies. And then we'll move into some tasks of preaching. First, I want you to, to simply be aware. Be aware that, beware of the live issues of those who are before you on a week to week basis. This requires you to know and to listen to the people who are in front of you, the people in the pews, to know something about the issues that affect them. It means you're having good conversations with them week to week. 
that your, what I call the pastoral spidey senses, they're up, right? You can tell when something's not right with people and you can check in with them and you can see what's going on in their lives. And you're asking them good questions to know what kinds of theological questions are arising for them, right? So know the live issues that are before you, but also be informed, Right? If you don't know anything about mental health and mental illness and somebody in your congregation is wrestling with that or they have a brother or sister or a son or daughter who's wrestling with that, go find information and not just Wikipedia information. Right? Be informed about the issues that people are wrestling with. Right? Um, if somebody in your congregation is wrestling with cancer, uh, then go find an oncologist to talk to if you don't know anything about it. Right? One of the things I recommend in my book, Tending the Tree of Life, is um, if you don't know anything about reproductive loss or about miscarriages, go find uh, a, a OBGYN to talk to and to learn. Right? Um, somebody will gladly spend 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. They'll let you buy them lunch, I'm sure. Right? Um, and to, to know, to become more informed. So be aware. And don't just be aware that things are live issues because you don't want to get up in the pulpit and talk about things that you haven't read about and you don't know deeply, okay? The second would be break silences and avoid avoidance. Those are two very different things. When I talk about breaking silence, I, I, I wanna suggest that there are things that may have never been uttered in the pulpit before in your context. One of the things I suggest um, in the Tending the Tree of Life book is for uh, a pastor who has never talked about this uh, reproductive loss, uh, infertility, kinds of things, to go up into a pulpit, right, in the middle of the week when nobody else is there, turn on the microphone, and simply lean into the microphone and say the words, infertility, miscarriage. And just let them the pass the area of your lips, right, and into the space that's around you. That's breaking a silence of your own accord, Right? And then bringing those words into worship in a different way. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. You, your congregation may have never talked about mental illness before. Right? And so it might be important for you to just get up in the pulpit in the middle of the week and say, mental illness. And just let the words brush past your lips before they come alive. Right? So break silences. But then there's a, there's a different aspect, and that's um, avoid avoidance. So what are the issues that are going on in a congregation that, that people suggest that maybe you shouldn't talk about? What are the taboos? Interrogate the taboos. Why is it that, I, that people think or suggest or there's this sort of culture of silence around this? Why is it that we avoid X, Y, Z topic? Right? Is there some sort of larger congregational narrative that maybe I don't have the history on quite yet, right? Why don't we, why doesn't anyone ever talk about suicide? Was it because 10 years ago, somebody in the congregation who was very important committed suicide and you know, there was a, a powerful narrative surrounding that and people have just sort of closed themselves off of that, right? Interrogate the taboos. Understand why they may have not been discussed before. The next is um, to recognize your location, right? Um, and this is, I think, in particularly important for the younger preachers in the room, right? To recognize that perhaps you have not come into contact with a lot of the issues that people are wrestling around with. Um, just because of your stage in life. And, and to be okay with that. Um, but don't let that stop you, right? That's why that, this, this is more important, right? To be aware and to be informed. To recognize your location, but then to aim for respectful and loving transgression of your location. Meaning that you can't speak out of other people's experiences and don't try. But you can speak for them and with them. Right? Being careful not to, uh, to take uh, their experiences into the pulpit and name them in specific ways without permission. Right? Um, to be careful is the next one about spiritualizing difficult biblical texts especially those that may present themselves as texts of terror so um, as I suggested at the beginning 
The stories of Abram and Sarai for me and Hannah and Elkanah and others became for me a kind of text of terror. Right? I couldn't see the God that was behind those stories in my life. Right? And, and the pastors who were preaching those stories were, were spiritualizing them as matters of, well, this story is about faith. And yeah, it is about faith. Those stories are about faith. But they're also about real issues that people deal with. Right? And so don't spiritualize them so much that they become disconnected from human experience in the real ways that people experience life. Right? Does everybody know what a text of terror is? Am I... Speaking everybody's language here, texts that do injury and wound us when we hear them. Right? There are a lot, a lot of these kinds of texts. Do you suggest that we would say that we're say? No. <laughs> I, 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 the whole counsel of God, right, um, is something that, no, because if we start staying away from them, people know that we're avoiding them. Why doesn't our pastor ever talk about Abram and Sarai? These pillars of the faith, or yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So um, one of the things we want to acknowledge, um, and I'll come to this in just a minute, is I think part of the good news is just being able to identify that these great heroes of the faith struggled with real human issues, right? That. Abram and Sarai had some serious grief and loss over their lives, right? That they wrestled with the same kind of stuff that we do. And yeah, God was faithful to them. Uh, God blessed them, but maybe the blessings might come to us in different ways that we had not quite imagined. That's a, that's a way with that particular kind of text that I would, I would suggest we wrestle with it. Hagar, yeah. So how would you, how would you, uh, I guess, reconcile the Hagar part? Yeah. Yeah, this is not easy. <laughs> I'm not, and I don't want to suggest that it is, right? Um, because there's some really terrible stuff that happens there, right? Hagar gets cast off into the desert, and, and yet God promises to be faithful to her. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's not helpful to our people to avoid biblical texts, but to wrestle with them faithfully and with the questions that, that may proceed from, from our real life experiences and not just say, hey, we're going to talk about how great um, and how faithful Abram and Sarai was, right? Um, wrestle with the nitty gritty. People respect you for that, right? People are coming to our congregations or perhaps not coming so much anymore because we've done that with texts. We've just said, well, this is about faith. And so, no, you're, my life is missing here from your interpretation. Yeah, great question. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, At least in part. <laughs> um, attend to the social and cultural and theological worlds of biblical text. This is another kind of answer to the question that you've asked, right? So, so what's going on socially and culturally and theologically in the text here? Right. And I keep pointing to Abram and Sarah, but you, you might also point to things like, uh, um, you know, um, for instance, in the Gospels, the demoniac stories, right? Is there a way that they perhaps talked about mental illness in the ways that we don't, right? Th those kinds of lines, you know, may get drawn, right? Are there, are there ways that we can respectfully engage with the, the biblical text in their, in their context, right? In the way that they understood the world, the way they understood God and the way they under, understand and understood um, uh, the way that the world worked, right? So be very attentive, right? Uncover your Bible dictionaries and your, your commentaries to understand the cultural world. So those are some general strategies. Any that you might, you might add here? I don't think this is a definitive list. Anything pop in your head? Any questions on this? All right, so let's talk about some tasks of preaching. I divide these into two categories, pastoral tasks and prophetic tasks. It's a sort of a false distinction, but I need it, um, at least for the moment. So one of the things we want to do is we want to reaffirm the personhood of those who come to us. 
Um, one of the things that happens in these significant pastoral care issues is uh, we begin to ask, and people will begin to ask themselves, who am I before God? Am I less of a human being, right? Am I, is something in me missing or broken, right? Or, or defaulted, uh, or excuse, excuse me, faulty. And one of the things we want to do is reaffirm that people are in fact made in the image of God with all of the stuff that they bring to us. And we want to wrestle really faithfully with what it means to be human and to have a human body that's vulnerable. I'll give you a quick story. Um, my father passed away unexpectedly over the summer. Um, and so we were sitting in my mom's house and uh, all the people from her and his church came over. Uh, and this, uh, this woman... Uh, sat down, had the audacity to sit across from me at the kitchen table, uh, huge South Carolina hair, a fistful of gold rings. Uh, and she looked at a young woman who was sitting next to me, had a little child on her knee. And she looked at the woman and she said, um, oh, this, is, this is so sad, but, but David had served his purpose. Oh, David is my dad's name. David had served his purpose, right? And God, it was, it was his time to go. And I'm thinking, I've got a six-year-old daughter right here. Um, he didn't go to graduate, get to go to her high school graduation. Get, didn't get to see her go to college. On and on and on. He was supposed to be here. No, he had not served his purpose, right? Uh, and one of the things that's just important for us to say is, look, like, look, my dad's body was vulnerable, and all of our bodies are vulnerable in different ways. They're not perfect creations, right? Um, in, in terms of working the way that they should work all the time. And I think that's a theology we need to invest in um, and be careful about, right? She had obviously not ever heard that from a pulpit before. So I want us to express, related to express care and concern without easy answers, right? I want you to present yourself as one who walks with people, uh, who journeys with them, rather than the person who is charged with dispensing the theological pleasantries that go down like sugar, right? Um, you're not the answer person. And sometimes our deepest theological questions don't have great answers or easy answers, right? I want you to help negotiate cycles of hope and despair. Negotiate cycles of hope and despair. So one of the things that um, was particular to uh, our experience as people who were experiencing reproductive loss was uh, months where, uh, where our hopes would go up and months where our hopes would go down, right? Because that's the sort of natural order of things. Um, you hope something will work and then it doesn't work, right? And that happens with a number of different things, right? Uh, a cancer patient, right, who's going through chemo or radiation, hope goes up that the treatment will work. And then perhaps if it doesn't, it goes down, right? And perhaps so we're going to try something new this time around. And the hope's going to go up, and then it's going to come down in despair. Your job is to help negotiate and walk with those cycles of hope and despair. Not to alleviate, not to answer with easy answers. Same with grief and loss, right? Your job is to help navigate and not resolve. Your job is not to say, look, it's going to be all right. No, it's not, <laughs> right? Not everything is going to be all right, at least immediately, right? And so we need to be honest with people, right? And not be the people who dispense easy answers. Then we want to help identify God's presence and gifts amidst decisions to be made. All right, we're starting to run up against our time, so I'm going to... Um, say that Barbara Brown Taylor has this great book about God's silence, which is an important book to read for those of us who are engaging in pastoral care in the pulpit. And uh, she loves, has this great quote. Um, I don't think it made it into the slides that are uh, on your, on your um, handout. The next thing I want to talk about as we start to wrap up is these pro prophetic tasks of preaching uh, in terms of pastoral care issues. So uh, I alluded to this before, um, identify and help make sense of ethical, cultural, social, and economic factors in the issues at, at hand. Again, to bring this back up, 
um, the inf infant mortality rates in Flint, Michigan are going up. You've got families who are grieving, right? And that's a very discreet pastoral care issue, right? But that's also related to something that's going on socially and culturally. And it's the preacher's prophetic task to take care of that, to deal with that in responsible ways. Offer an alternative kingdom of God-shaped imagination. If there are pastoral care issues that are going on uh, that require a, a sense of what's going on and what's connected in terms of the um, social, cultural, and ethical um, uh, uh, connections going on in our um, communities, then how is it that you get to offer an alternative imagination? What ways are we present with and for one another? Cast a vision. And then finally, I want us to counter pop theology. What do I mean by that? How many times have you heard from people's lips, it's God's will, it's God's timing, God is teaching you or God is testing you, right? These are the kinds of, uh, we said in, before, embedded theologies that are rumbling around and rumbling around in people. And we want to begin to uh, carefully dismantle those, mm -hmm. right, in ways that are contextually appropriate in your community, right, and for the theology that you deeply hold, right? Um, and so make sure you're doing that. All right, last slide, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so uh, I make this statement in the book, preaching and worship as pastoral care is as much communal as it is individual. We're not just speaking into people's individual lives, but we're speaking into communities. It's as much congregational as it is societal and global. Pastoral care issues are never disconnected from the issues that are at play within society at large and indeed in our globe. Um, as much about inhabiting a new image of the pastor as it is developing a new way of talking about a or more difficult subject. So I just want you to carefully consider what this might mean for your preaching and for your ministry. Any questions from those who are here? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>